estoy representando al CARI de manera que les doy la bienvenida a todos en nombre del CARI y del Comité de Ciencia y Tecnología. Este, el tema de hoy es un tema que creo que para todos o para la gran mayoría de la, de la dirigencia argentina es o debía ser eh, realmente muy importante. La idea de que la Argentina pueda convertirse en un país que se desarrolle y crece en base al conocimiento parecía ser eh, una cuestión casi crítica, digamos. Y, y por lo tanto, esta ocasión de, de tener a Oren Gershman con nosotros para discutir uh, y aprender y conocer, conocer la experiencia que han tenido en Israel. Eh, Oren nos contaba que eh, por allá por el año 84 Israel era un país con 450% de inflación anual y prácticamente exportaba las naranjas. Y, y que debido algunas decisiones estratégicas, supo cambiar eso y hacer una transformación fenomenal, una transformación de pasar de ese tipo de economía de materias primas a una economía basada en el desarrollo de eh, empresas tecnológicas, de mucha financiación de capital de riesgo, de, el número de patentes, el número de centros de investigación y desarrollo multinacionales que residen hoy en, en, en Israel. Si lo tomamos per cápita, Israel en este momento es el país líder en términos de todos esos eh, indicadores. De modo que escuchar eh, la experiencia de Oren, que quisiera bueno, recordar un poquito que él, este, Primero de todo es director ejecutivo de una consultora global que se llama Identity Roads. Él ha sido miembro del consejo directivo de numerosos fondos de inversión. Ha fundado y dirigido más de 75 empresas de tecnología, startups. Ha asesorado en estas cuestiones al gobierno de Nueva Zelanda y hoy día está colaborando con una incubadora de empresas tecnológicas financiada por el grupo Sancor Seguros, que se llama CITES y, y que tiene sus sedes en su chale Santa Fe. Y me parece que es su intención eh, no solo contarnos la experiencia eh, en Israel, eh, sino también eh, hacer sus reflexiones acerca de la experiencia que ha tenido la Argentina ya desde hace un par de años o algo más, este, en particular con CITE, pero él conoce ya bastante del sistema científico y tecnológico argentino. De manera que me parece que su charla va a tener un doble interés, el interés de conocer la experiencia israelita y el interés de conocer su opinión acerca de lo que está pasando en Argentina y que podría pasar. Él nos ha dicho que cree que Argentina tiene un enorme potencial más de lo que nosotros a veces pensamos. Oren, I'm not sure how much you uh, understand about Spanish, but I, I, I believe that you may have an idea of what I've just said about you and about the expectations we have on, about your, your, your uh, coming talk. Uh, I really want to say that uh, we thank you very much for coming. Uh, finally, we made it <laughs> because we've been behind this idea of having you here for about two years, I believe. Um, uh, we really look forward to your talk and your comments and your um, knowledge and your experiences. Uh, I know that, uh, and I just said that, that you are working in Argentina already for some time and you are collaborating very strongly with these uh, institutions called CITES, in Spanish, CITES, I guess, in English, uh, which is funded by San Jose. Um, okay, and um, so again, thank you very much. It's your turn. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to talk to you. So, Paul, is it now? It's a great honor for me to be able to 
slides. Um, I want to take the upcoming hour and then as much as we will be able to continue uh, to explore a um, topic which related to the ability of the nation to develop knowledge economy. Now, knowledge economy has all kinds of uh, uh, meaning, but I will get into that uh, and tips uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, make, to make that real. In the last... Uh, in the last uh, four years, I've had the honor to visit Argentina and to visit Argentina many times. Uh, many times meaning about a week every month on ground in Argentina. I will try to take this discussion and to combine two aspects. One of them is the Israeli case study uh, and analyze the evolution of one of the most sophisticated knowledge economy in the world. And at the same time, um, try to combine that with my observations uh, and many hours uh, and many days and many weeks in Argentina with regarding to the opportunities, regarding to the challenges, uh, and with regarding to the practices within Argentina. Um, but I do ask you to take the upcoming hour and allow yourself to dream for a moment. Uh, just do it with open eyes so you can see the, the slide. There might be some interesting data on those slides. Uh, and you might find out that, that at the end of this uh, conversation, um, some of the elements which you dream about uh, really exist, but you're not really being aware to. And with regard to the others, um, challenges are needed to be, uh, to be dealt with. I want to take you to a discussion about um, a nation, about a nation that turned its, its, its entire uh, economical uh, uh, infrastructure from an agricultural base um, to what considered to be the second Silicon Valley of the world. Uh, some say it's the first. Uh, I will analyze one of the policies, one of the public-private partnership policies, a very sophisticated one, which exists in Israel and try to compare that to Argentina. Try again at the end to summarize um, this, this whole discussion. Uh, and as I said, at some point of time in the discussion, I will allow, I will allow myself to do a hard stop and give you my observations about some of the crucial elements which regard into the ability of a nation, uh, in this case Argentina, to develop uh, knowledge economy capabilities about Argentina, not something theoretically, um, but in practice. Um, and yes, I, I do know that the two nations are not the same. Uh, Argentina got about six times more people than Israel. Um, Israel is, well, Argentina is about 130 times bigger than Israel. Um, the GDP in Israel is about three times more than Argentina. And yes, Israel is leading all OECD countries with an index that representing the research and development expenditures, expenditures, not investments. We will get to that. We'll analyze this index. It's one of the most crucial index that symbolize economical activity within this domain. Um, leading an all OECD country with this index uh, of 4.3%. And Argentina, though it's not in this part of the OECD, uh, is located somewhere between Mexico and Chile, but this is down the road. This is not representing the true value and potential that there is in, in the nation. Um, and I've done a simple uh, extrapolations. Uh, it's not an economical sophisticated one, but just a simple one so you could understand the impact of what an economy can make to a nation. So this is the current, uh, 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 the, something went wrong with the computer or with the presentation. The GDP of Argentina is about 500 billion, 545 billion US that was in, in 2016. Uh, if Argentina will be capable to develop some of the, some of the results in Israel, the GDP will uh, cross the, two, the 2,500 billion US. This is knowledge economy. And that is referred just to the adjustment by 
by the population. If I will make the adjustment by size of the nation, I will get to a little bit less than 100,000 billion as a GDP for the nation. But even if the second number is absolutely wrong, and the second and the, the, the first one is should, should cut by half, I would assume that Argentina would not need any assistance from the uh, 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 IMF with regard to any uh, economic support, because the nation could assist all the region uh, with uh, economic support. Knowledge effect, knowledge economy. When we are using raw material and energy, we have less of them. When we are using knowledge, we have more of it. That is the idea. That is the basis principle uh, of what knowledge economy is. Um, and to avoid any uh, claims that in Israel we have everything. Uh, we have venture capital, we have multinationals, we have, we have entrepreneurs, we have engineers, we have research. Everything is crystal clear. This is where it all started. Uh, and it didn't start about 300 years ago. It started only three decades ago. And the results, and I will share that with you, been shown very fast down the road, very fast. So that's where everything started. Uh, and Argentina today is by far in a better situation than hyperinflation of 150% a year. This is Israel today, the nation with the largest number of multinational per capita. And actually, this is a hub of knowledge and trade uh, of everything that related to advanced technologies and companies. It all started around mid 80s with the hyperinflation, with the hyperinflation uh, and the fact that uh, we then didn't have any natural resources. We have found some, but, but it's not equal to the, 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 the amount uh, that Argentina have today uh, and, have, and has in the past. And around the um, beginning of the beginning of mid 80s in this crisis, traditional industries, which, which was textile, moved to the Far East. And agriculture is a bit hard to do without any water, and we, are, and we don't have uh, a lot of water, if to say the least. Um, so in those days, the government announced or established three uh, activities, which were the cornerstone of the entire high-tech industry. The first one is Yuzma. It was the first public-private partnership um, that the government announced that it will match uh, private money to public money in a proportion of one to one, and establish 10 VC companies with a total amount of $100 million, which in those days considered to be a lot of money. Uh, in today's scale, it's considered to be a small to medium uh, uh, VC, and there is a lot, a, lot, a lot more than that in Israel today. At the same time, it's 1991, for uh, other reasons, the, the State of Israel establishing the Technology Incubator Program, which was aimed to integrate it, the immigration that coming from foreign Russia, uh, beginning of the uh, 90s, the state of Israel is only 4 million people uh, and, the, uh, and it's observed about million people, which is about 25% of the entire population. 40% uh, out of them were engineers and PhDs and the idea was to observe them into the ecosystem and not to lose them uh, to other countries. Um, and along the, along the road, this, this program changed its face and we will analyze this program in the sense of public-private partnerships and its contribution to the knowledge economy. And actually today, uh, uh, there is more than 40 programs that managing under one agency. It used to be uh, under the Ministry of Economy, today it's the, the Agency of Innovation. <coughs> supporting those initiatives, we will get into that in, in a bit more detail. Um, it's called Startup Nation. Uh, not nominal amount, uh, not, not per capita, nominal amount. Israel is still after the states in China with number of companies listed on the Nasdaq. Eight million people. Tiny country, sell after the states and, 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 and China. Uh, global leading in venture capital activities and a lot of R&D of multinational centers located in Israel. And a huge amount of success story. Now success story in the sense of knowledge economy is when you're taking an idea develop this idea in a form of startup company and sell it. Take the cash, developing another idea. Pack it in a, in a company, sell it, and continue. And that's kind of a, a in the internal forces that motivated or actually uh, moved the entire uh, knowledge economy. 
and you can see that the figures oops, sorry, moves from uh, from uh, tens of millions uh, to half a millions, uh, half a billions, uh, and that's that's happened on a monthly basis. I mean, there are about dozens of them uh, every year, and there are mega exit. Mega exit is when. A uh, company has been exiting a value of more than a billion dollars. Just last year, Intel wrote a check, a check in cash for an idea that was developed from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem of $15.3 billion. $15.3 billion. That's a lot of money. Uh, and actually, the government found itself in a kind of, kind of a, a strange situation that they have over tax collection of $7.5 billion which in Israel in Mishak, it's about three and a half or four times more than that because of the exchange rate. And that's an amazing, amazing uh, uh, a gift for the nation. Uh, but that is knowledge economy. In Israel, um, per capita, uh, there is about twice as much as the state and about 20 times as more as the China and, and Europe all together in VC uh, investment per capita. We will analyze the reason that so many venture capitals in the world position their front office and injecting money into the ecosystem uh, that enable those kinds of uh, uh, amazing results. In 2017, the total exit, meaning exporting knowledge, was more than $23 billion. Uh, about a month ago, I had the opportunity to meet the governor of Mendoza. This is more than the GDP of the entire province. Uh, so that's the impact of what knowledge economy can do. And universities are a crucial element in that. Universities in Israel are fully subsidized by the government. But above all government subsidies, the universities succeeded to generate it, income by commercializing their idea in values of uh, a bit less than three quarters of a billion dollars. And that is on a yearly basis. And most of this amount is passive income. Passive income is due to the fact that they are licensing the idea to the private sector, private sector developing those spin-offs and paying them uh, royalties. And it's very diverse. There is no one segment that being controlled uh, in this in this whole industry. Uh, we can see uh, 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 the, in the years uh, percentage of, uh, of the mix of, of uh, exit that was taking place uh, between uh, 2012 and 2016 and it's moved from agri-tech to IT to medical devices to pharma to clean tech and there is no one, one domain activity that are controlling the uh, economical uh, um, effect of, of this domain. As we've stated, this is a tiny, tiny nation located in a place in the Middle East, which unfortunately we cannot trade with our neighbors. They are very rich, live politics aside, we cannot trade with them. Um, and that's enforced Israeli entrepreneurs uh, and Israeli companies uh, to develop a practice that's called going global from day one. Because 8 million people is not a potential market and we cannot trade with our neighbors, so we're going global. Going global from day one, it's a set of mind, it's a way of building and developing companies that they are, the first market will be the States or Europe or China, um, and that companies can do that. One of the ways to do so is by using a very sophisticated uh, tool that called intellectual property. Patents. Enable using patents in order to competitive advantage within different territories, which is not Israel. And this is the first time when I'm doing an art stop in this conversation and trying to refer to Argentina. Um, as I've stated, I've spent a lot of time, and I've talked to a lot of people, and I've talked to people from the industry, and people from the academia. Uh, and you've got an amazing, amazing uh, uh, high-tech industries uh, in, in Argentina. I have people from uh, the government, uh, um, students, uh, been to uh, uh, um, research centers. And this is one of the first challenges of Argentina in changing the mindset. And the, and, and, and the results are the follows, or the, the observations are the follows. 
Since 1976, only 25,000 applications was filed with Argentina as a country of priority, meaning that Argentinians do not understand the importance of this tool and how aggressive this tool could be in order to prevent competitors to come to Argentina and in order to block competitive within the far destination. You can sit in Argentina, develop an idea, and block the Chinese, the American, and the European. So the only way that you can use this product is that if they will pay hard cash, euros and dollars, to you in Argentina. You can do it. It's a sophisticated practice. But there is no awareness to those, uh, uh, to those, uh, uh, to those tools. Um, if we look at the numbers of applications, since uh, most of them uh, are failed after 1990, and since 2006, something is happening in Argentina. I didn't get to investigate what's happening in Argentina, but the numbers have dropped uh, uh, dramatically. Patent that was granted out of those that were left is very, very low. Since year 2000, it's kind of uh, stable, but the numbers is very low. It's less than 100. This line is less than 100, meaning that even those patents that already been used or been filed, the numbers that, that reach to, to, to a state which are, that are granted is very low. Um, who filing most of the patent? Well, this is Conicet. Conicet is the main player in Argentina that's filing patents. Uh, if this is Conicet's responsibility to protect those IPs and to be able to take them all the way, the answer is absolutely no. It's very expensive tool. It's a very sophisticated, it's very aggressive, but it's very expensive. One IP, one patent can cost $150,000, $200,000 on a life cycle. There are companies that have 5, 10, 15 patents. This is a lot of money. That cost a lot. It's a very sophisticated tool that can block competition in far, in far territories, but it costs a lot of money. And the one that granted was less than 6%. Out of the 400 patents that was, that was filed by Conicet, only 6% was granted. Meaning that something is done wrong. Is it Conicet's responsibility? The answer is absolutely no. Absolutely no. It's the responsibility of the owners or the private sector that will potentially take those ideas, develop them, and will expend the uh, necessary amount to protect those, uh, those ideas. In hundreds of thousands and in millions of dollars, I used to, uh, in my background in the last 20 years, uh, as a taking developers and a VC uh, industry guy, I've established and managed about 75 companies um, in the last 20 years. I've expenditures and paid for patents hundreds of thousands of dollars. Because this is a very sophisticated tool and this is the only way that you can create global companies from day one. If we try to summarize those, those old findings, um, we can see that most of the patent uh, was, uh, uh, was filed by Conicet, but they have not get into any maturity. Uh, again, I'm not claiming that this is Conicet's responsibility in any way. On the contrary, I think that that uh, responsibility is on the private sector and maybe uh, if there will be better uh, relationship and connection and in, in, in the private sector will be licensed more IPs from Conicet, there will be a way to create value to those, uh, to those ideas. Uh, the numbers of patents which are granted is, uh, is stable but it's very low. And the most amazing thing for me is one that been on ground weeks and weeks and so amazing high-level sophistications of, uh, uh, of science, applicable science and basic science, is the fact that eventually the domain that are being protected by intellectual property in Argentina are medical, dental and toilet uh, purposes. Trust me, I saw different things. I saw uh, uh, physics and I saw biotechnology and I saw amazing things which are not toilet purposes. Meaning that there is something that doesn't work properly in the system and maybe the first thing related to the awareness of the importance of uh, intellectual property.
Leaving Argentina for a second and going back to Israel, uh, this is the, the, uh, the, the living creature that we call an IT ecosystem. Uh, it's built out of uh, uh, elements that relate to culture, education, universities, government support, we were getting to that, the venture capital industry, the traditional industry and the advanced industries. Two things we need to remember about this living creature, it's a very dynamic one. In order to create it, you need to establish a critical mass of activity in a short period of time. In places which does not exist, the factor of time is crucial. It's not developing those capabilities over 15 years. It doesn't work. You need to create a critical mass in a very short period of time. Second, once it's that being created, you cannot stop the ecosystem. The state of Israel, and I would refer to that, in two worldwide crises. Uh, the first one is September 2000, when the internet bubble was blast. Uh, and then in August 2008, uh, when the financial crisis in the state uh, uh, has a code, has a code. The state of Israel continued to invest and to support the public-private partnership. All of those 40 policies, like nothing has happened. And I, as a private sector, not a government, uh, 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 um, um, not, not a government uh, 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 workers or, or, or agents, or not the private sector, I could continue to create companies and to build new companies just because one thing, I was backed by the government. And the government understand that this budget, we will analyze the budget, is something which, in general, we had good years and bad years. This is something that nobody uh, is, is, is touching. Um, this is the innovation cycle, and it's very simple. Uh, as I've stated, government uh, rain grants all year long, uh, good years and bad years, and collected its benefits through exit, taxes, royalties, and foreign investment that flow to the uh, 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 flow to the nation, and by that enable to grow an ecosystem uh, with entrepreneurs and R and D uh, infrastructures. Uh, and again, that's happening in good years and bad years uh, all year long. All year long, it's a very sophisticated structure that managing by the agency of innovation that used to be under the Ministry of Economy, and that's supporting early stage companies, more mature companies, big companies. Even big companies in Israel can get grant from the uh, 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 Agency of Innovation. That's supporting C, generic R&D, competitive R&D, and not just locally. Those programs are being managed nationally, and those programs are being managed internationally with collaboration with the uh, European Union or with uh, bilateral agreement like there is between Israel and Argentina. Uh, so, the philosophy of the government is that they are not just given the resources, they have succeeded to build a very sophisticated mechanism supporting all types of companies. Uh, the entire life cycle of those companies from an IP to an IPO uh, and do so locally and internationally. How much that, how much does it cost? I mean, it's look like, like a dream, so how much does that cost? The state of Israel investing under the, uh, and again, this is not related to universities, this is not related to uh, education, this is just related to research and development within the private sector, civil research and development. Our government invested about $300 million a year. In Israel there is no free meal. No free meal. If you succeed, pay it back. If you didn't succeed, nothing has happened. Try again and again and again. You will not be penalty. Actually, you will be great. You will be uh, 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 um, get uh, even a, a better uh, uh, grades uh, on those uh, following attempts. About one third of that is being paid back to the government. So actually, the government investing not more than two hundred million dollar a year by a national budget. This is nothing. Uh, truly, truly nothing. And those success are being paid by royalties uh, uh, of those uh, grants. This is the secret sauce. This is the metrics. This is the economical metrics that enable all of that to happen. When we are referring to early stage, government investing about can get to invest about 85% of those investments. And as time goes by and those companies are growing, the percentage are going and being reduced. But this is percentage wise. When we're talking about nominal amount of money within the $300 million, it's the other way around. 
So in the early stage, the government investing the smallest amount of money and the solid company, the largest amount of money. But that creates a situation that incentivizes the private sector to expend money. And this is a magical matrix, a truly, truly magical matrix. The results of that are amazing. Truly, truly amazing by, by all means. Israel leading the uh, all OECD country with the index that uh, measuring uh, domestic spending on R&D out of the GDP. Practically, those are salaries, raw material, engineering, manufacturing in small scales of high advanced research and development. That was more than close to $13 billion in 2015. Uh, Argentina is somewhere around this, this area. Uh, this is the index in which government sending delegation to Israel to understand and to crack the secret sauce. Because this is the dream of every government, to enable that to happen. But there is a huge bad. If this money is being expenditures out of the government budget, it doesn't make any sense. We have just mentioned before that the state of Israel is investing 300 million, and I'm talking about 13 billion. So where the rest is, is coming from? And this is the most amazing thing. This, this index, by the way, growing since 1995 until today. 85%, um, 83% of that is private sector, which is a magical number. And the most amazing thing, the most amazing thing, is that half of that don't even Israeli money. It's not Israeli textile money, it's foreign money that coming to Israel. What are the sources of those money? One of the sources are the multinational companies. In Israel there is, uh, uh, as we uh, uh, today, about 360 com multinational companies in Israel. Uh, it doesn't compare to any other nation in the world per capita. Uh, and you can see that those are the biggest players in the world. Now, you need to remember, this is not front office. They are not selling licenses or product. They are paying salaries to Israeli engineers in US dollars and in euros, uh, which inject uh, uh, this or enable the, the, uh, uh, those resources. This is about $6 billion a year. This is 50% out of the uh, uh, 13 billion, out of the 83% uh, or the 13 billion. Um, but we didn't have it. We didn't have it since the age of time. We have mentioned that this all happened in the last uh, three decades. If we are trying to see what made those multinationals come to Israel, until 1974 there was only three of them. And actually the state of Israel needed to give subsidies or to incentivize them to come to Israel. Since the age of the end of the 90s, beginning of the uh, end of the uh, uh, 80s, beginning of the 90s, uh, they have come one after the others without getting any subsidies. And you can see Microsoft, Cisco, Assad. Uh, those multinationals coming from maybe three reasons. The first one is that they have purchased a company in Israel or several companies and they needed to aggregate the management of those companies. Second is that they, they have identified uh, 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 good ideas and they are keen to seek uh, uh, additional uh, uh, ideas to, to, to be developed and the quality of the human resources. And the third one is because they could not allow themselves not to be in Israel. Uh, April came to Israel in 2012 uh, after uh, Samsung, LG, and Huawei uh, uh, brought their army centers to Israel. So they, they understand that something is happening which they cannot uh, uh, stay far from, from, from this territory. Um, university got a very important role in this, in this whole ecosystem. Uh, one of the highest numbers in patents uh, 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 in academic, uh, in, in academic uh, uh, capital, uh, a lot of engineering, uh, uh, highest, highest level of engineering in the working force, uh, and beside every university in Israel, there is a Polisek like. So you have one Polisek in Israel, there is by every university, by every hospital, there is a TTO that's responsible to take the idea, to identify researchers with the good ideas, protect it with a patent, license this patent to the private sector. Now we saw there is a lot of uh, private sector players that are looking for good ideas, uh, and by that enable the creations of uh, those three quarters of a billion dollar in, um, in on, a, on a royalty basis. And just so you understand the scope and the, and the size of that, 
sherry tomatoes. Um, well, every time that you're eating sherry tomatoes in your salad, just be aware, you are paying royalties to the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. For every seed of sherry tomatoes that have been sitting around the world, there is royalty to the Hebrew University. So you can understand that the scope and the capabilities of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the academia, if there is understanding about the importance of IP and the ability to license those ideas, uh, is something which is crucial. Uh, and about three quarters of, of, this, of those resources are practically passive income. Passive income, the, 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 uh, the around 500 million, it's licensing of idea and they're getting royalties. They do not work to develop those ideas. They are continuing to, to invent new and new and new ideas in order to license to the private sector. Venture capital. As we speak, there is about $3.5 billion waiting for investment. Uh, that was in 2017, but it doesn't change a lot in, in, in 2018. Uh, and there is a lot of foreign venture capital in Israel. And they are coming because there are a lot of opportunities for them to invest and to make uh, their, uh, their uh, revenues. And this is in hundreds of every years. Well, culture. Culture is a significant element within the creation of the ecosystem. Uh, and this is where there are probably some, some differences between uh, Argentina and Israel. Um, every week that you will come to Israel, there will be a conference on IT, uh, biotech, uh, medical devices, agri-tech, whatever, and, and international conferences. Uh, academic courses have been teaching anthropology. Uh, and actually, it's starting in, in high school. There are programs in high school that are teaching entrepreneurs, and those entrepreneurs are not teach by teachers from the Ministry of Education. They are doing so with people from the industry. So in the last few years, I've had the honor to meet a lot of those talented young people that get out at the beginning of the year, uh, in groups needed to nominate a CEO, a CFO, a CTO, find a problem, usually a social problem, try to solve it, raise money, raise real money from friends, family, foes, develop the product, try to sell it, and at the end of the year, going to the summer vacation, liquidated the company, going to the summer vacation. But that gives them an experience at the age of 16 and 17, in which after they will finish the military service, they could have, they could already have uh, this experience. Again, a full stop. One of the advantages of, uh, 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 <coughs> of Argentina in that sense is that I saw something that I couldn't see in Israel. And this is PhD at the, at the age of 26. Uh, you have a lot of very talented people uh, in this nation, and many of them are highly educated. Israeli guy that's finishing the army at the age of uh, 21, 22, uh, could start his academic uh, career at the age of 25. You have them already ready and cooked to be part of the ingredients that uh, uh, are moving this whole uh, industry forward. Going back to Israel, and that's, a, that's again a huge change between Argentina and Israel. In Israel, to fail, consider to be an asset. If you have failed, meaning that you have an experience, you are not being judged to be failed. I have recruited a lot of CEOs to my startup companies. I would never, or I would try to prevent recruiting a CEO that haven't had this red line on his CV, I failed. Because then is less experience. Uh, failing, giving you the experience of, uh, of dealing with failures and giving you the mental ability to deal with, with, with failures, which is highly important. Incentivize uh, failures. Actually, not incentivize. Embracing failures, not incentivize failures, which is, which is different. Uh, because if you have never uh, made any mistakes, you, you probably didn't, didn't uh, make uh, anything new in, in your life. Now, one of the policies, uh, one of those 40 policies that I was mentioning uh, about, uh, that is managed by, the, by uh, uh, um, the Israel Innovation Authority that uh, historically was managing under the Ministry of Economy uh, related to the Taking Cuba program. So here's the idea, and this is, doesn't make any sense. Government will support project which the private sector is not willing to invest. To take taxpayer money, to invest that in companies which the success rate is 1 to 10, it's like taking taxpayer money 
and going with that to the casino. Exactly the same, the same, the same, the same thing. But here's the trick. <coughs> that is part of an, uh, an internal or, or, or kind of a holistic structure that's reducing risk for the private sector and enable the private sector to inject those 83% out of the uh, uh, GDP, which is turned to be $13 billion and develop those companies. And this is a very aggressive uh, policy. Uh, the policy stated that the government would invest about $600,000 in every company, every idea. 85% will come from the government, only 15% will come from the private sector. If you succeed, if you succeed, success based on paying back and if you didn't, nothing is happening. Government investing in that about $50 million a year. Um, there are about 18 incubators in Israel, which actually kind of a mechanism to create startup and push them into the ecosystem. So the venture capital would have a raw material to come in to invest, and the multinational will have, have a raw material to invest, because they are taking very risky ideas, basic science, applicable science, develop that into a company, which the level of risk is aligned with the private sector, and then it can continue to bring additional resources, $13 billion, to develop those ideas and to turn them into $23 billion, which is um, exporting knowledge uh, from Israel uh, based on 2017 uh, uh, data. And 2017 was, in, was including one big exit. Uh, if we're looking back, it's around 10 to $12 billion on a yearly basis. Um, and here's the metrics. The government giving franchise to the private sector, uh, only to the own to specific private sectors uh, that got this franchise to invest about $600,000, about, uh, about 500000 coming from the government and only less than 100000 coming from the, uh, coming from the uh, private sector. And the private sector could take equity in those companies between 50 to 30 percent, and then the founder would have the matching or the million uh, um, uh, structure. Now, assuming one of those companies was exiting a value of 100 billion dollars, the private sector will, which invests in 90,000, he will not have 50 percent. He will be less because he will be diluted. So, assuming he will have only 30 percent, so he's investing. $90,000, get $30 million out of this investment if this company succeeds. Actually, need to pay back the 500000 so it's 29.5, which is a highly aggressive incentivized for the private sector to participate. Do you see the government somewhere around here? No. Government is not part of that. <coughs> government build the policies to incentivize the private sector to practice in this whole arena, but government do not participate in, in holding equity or managing companies. That's the responsibility of the private sector. The result of this program is phenomenal. Just this program. This is one out of 40. Government <coughs> invested since 1991 until today about $50 million annually, which become to around <coughs> $600 million. The red line is the accumulated amount of money invested by the private sector in those companies. The state of Israel is not a venture capital. But if it was a venture capital, it was done better than many of the Silicon Valley VC today. When you have a very clear policy, very simple one, then the private sector can join those, uh, uh, join those uh, uh, activities. Uh, and the result is more than 2,000 companies that raised more than $5 billion, which then expenditures, uh, which tend to be expenditures within Israel, being some of Israeli engineers uh, and Israeli entrepreneurs. And the government would have done 5 six of this, uh, 5x on the investment. Now the question is, could that be duplicated? My answer to you is no. Many governments that come in and try sending delegations, Israel is seeing a lot of delegations from many governments around the world trying to crack the secret sauce, and when they are trying to do a blueprint, it's aimed to fail. Can that be created? The answer is yes. With the right adjustment to the different uh, 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 cultural and regulated uh, policies within the different territories. 
The first example is New Zealand. I'm working with the New Zealand government in the last four years and establishing New Zealand a technology incubator program on the national level. That the aim was to extract complicated IP from universities and to turn them into global company for the benefits of the New Zealand economy and to diversify the New Zealand economy uh, because it's highly dependent on the primary market, uh, which is milk and meat. Um, and this is what's been stated by the Ministry of uh, Business, Innovation and Employment uh, in, in one of those papers just uh, uh, um, a little bit after this, this program was announced. The idea is to give young entrepreneurs actually providing them a bit of encouragement, a little bit of help to go faster. Time is crucial. We've talked about creating, creating a, crucial, crit, uh, crit, uh, a critical mass, but time is crucial, and this is part of government responsibility to make it happen. And the other uh, uh, remark was about um, giving grant uh, because R&D tax credit are not relevant to, to this sector. Bear in mind that those companies will not generate income in the first three to five years. Basic science, applicable science, to develop taking time. And it doesn't create cash. And the idea is not to create cash. The idea is to develop ideas, uh, new molecules, uh, uh, new uh, uh, advanced materials, um, new uh, biotechnology, bio agri-tech te uh, technologies, and so on. So forth. it's take time. It's those companies will not have cash, so they could benefit from the tech from the tax credit. Again, a full stop. There was an initiative in Argentina about tax credit that was announced, I think, in the, in the, last, in the last year. This is not the, the same tax credit. The, the one that was established in Argentina was in order to incentivize private sector to invest in technology company. Excellent. Tier one. Very good policy. Because it incentivized private sector to invest in those tech companies and not to expect those tech companies to have revenues that they could benefit from the tax credit that they would not be able to get. The other example is Argentina. And here's a full disclosure. I'm partnering in what I'm going to show you. Ignore from any element that related to the idea that I'm trying to promote that and try to be with me on the technical element which I'm trying to emphasize about Argentina capabilities to build a, a specific management knowledge. Once I've said that, I can continue. Um, CITES. CITES is a company, uh, uh, is a tech incubator, actually an early stage venture capital located uh, in the province of Santa Fe, in this small city called uh, Sunchales, only 25,000 inhabitants, uh, owned by Sango Seguros. This is the uh, first ever tech incubator that capable of dealing with basic science and applicable science in Latin America. This is where it all started. Now, this, I'm not talking about uh, 20 years ago. I'm talking about less than four years ago. 2014, um, you can see Alejandro Simon, the CEO of Grupo San Jose Los. Um, you can see Nicolas Togliani, the current CEO of, uh, of CITES. Private sector, Mr. Brill, uh, Mariano Mayo, uh, public sector. Uh, and the conference was about starting to move in the wheels. Uh, and there was a huge vision and a huge dream. Um, last week, uh, a delegation from um, Inter-Latin American Developing Bank came to uh, explore the opportunity to invest in, in, in this structure. Due to their statement, they are investing in Latin America since 1996. They never saw any vehicle or management capabilities or group with those uh, like, like the one that, that there is in cities. There is a group of young people, all of them under the age of 40, at least was under the age of 40 four years ago. Some of them now are across this, this line. All of them young, talented, PhD, highly educated. And what we have done, what I have done, is work with them and build management capabilities to learn how to build company, 
to be global from day one, when we are referring to basic science and applicable science, destructive idea. Technology that will change the way humanity is producing, dealing with diseases, and so on and so forth. And many of the CEOs in those companies are young. And there is one company that is managing with the, uh, by, by a, a lady, she is under the age of 30. She is managing a company that potentially was a hundred million dollar. And she is managing this company like this is a hundred million dollar company. Not like this is the research grant that being given to someone. Because they are equipped with this specific knowledge and mindset and capabilities to do so. Going back to the issues of the IP, intellectual property, all of those ideas are based on hard science, basic science and, and, and applicable science. In the last four years, or the beginning of the FPT, we have tried to find, uh, the first two years was aimed to build the knowledge. And I've been on ground a week every month, a week every month and a half, on ground, building the knowledge within, within this team. And then starting to invest. Today there is eight investment, each one of them between 500 to 700,000 US dollars in cash, not in current. In current cannot develop basic science and applicable science. Cannot. Uh, and the result is amazing, as been stated by the representative of the Inter-African American Developing Bank. When we started this journey, I knew, but there was a concern around the table. If we can create deal flow, if company will come, if there is this quality of science in, in, in Argentina, well, I knew that the qualities exist. The second question was, would they, be, uh, would they come to Sochalis? Because this is not Buenos Aires. I and mean, in 2014, the only activity that was around science and innovation was in Buenos Aires. Today, uh, they have uh, screened more than <coughs> 600 ideas in the last two and a half years, investing in eight of them. And maybe the last investment is symbolized and ending the story in a discussion if management capabilities could be built within a nation. Uh, it is an Bano at the age of 34. He is a Uruguayan. He has been the uh, dean is done his uh, uh, PhD in, in Pasteur Institute in France, in Paris. He left Paris, came back to Uruguay. Continue to develop his idea in, in, in Pasteur, in, in Pasteur uh, Montevideo. He is relocating to live in San Chavez to develop his idea. And the idea is going to change the way uh, vaccines are being dealing with new, uh, uh, with, uh, with new diseases. Destructive idea. Truly going to change the way that humanity is going to develop vaccines to, to new diseases. And when you've been asked, how can you live by this, by this group of, 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 of um, people from, from the enemy? How, why, why did you left? He stated that this is the only place, he can, he can develop that in Paris. He would do it, or in Berlin, or in London. But this is the only place he can make an impact. And this is the only group that's capable of uh, uh, the system to be global company uh, in a successful way. This is even an extreme example of dealing with brain drain. The secondary mission or the third mission of nations when they're trying to develop an IT ecosystem is due to brain drain, which is a huge problem. <coughs> Argentina investing in every PhD guy a lot of money from the first grade to the time that he's finishing the university. A lot of money in order to build one PhD guy or PhD lady. And then what? They are taking this knowledge and contribute that to other economy. And they are paying taxes to other economy. And they are creating value to other economy. And the other economy, Chile could be, Uruguay could be, the States could be anywhere. But not back home. It doesn't make sense. In order to prevent that, Argentina needed to create the environment to enable to utilize the large economy. Just lately, uh, uh, this group has succeeded to get a, a, a grant 
Um, and they are in the process of raising a $24 million fund. Again, I remind you, I'm part of, you have that in mind. Full stop, another observation about Argentina. In November, November 2017, the Ministry of Production announced three public private partnerships for scientific accelerators, technology accelerators, and fund of funds. Ladies and gentlemen, those are one of the most sophisticated policies that I ever saw. But this is <coughs> not just this one. In the last four years, I'm working with the Indian government in order to build one policy, taking Kibera, which is going great, but this is one. You have succeeded to build three policies, three different policies that supporting the main basis of technology that need to be supported. Soft technologies with the uh, uh, technology accelerators, basic science and applicable science with the scientific accelerators, and then fund of fund that will be able to continue to invest in those companies as they will mature or will be able to show that they have succeeded to develop the, those ideas. This is a significant uh, achievement. I don't know about any other government, and trust me, I do know a little bit about what's going around the world in that, in that essence, that succeed to develop such a sophisticated, not one, but three policies, public-private partnership, which is the art of this whole discussion. How government to incentivize private sector to participate in order to utilize knowledge economy to, uh, or to create their, or to enable the realization of knowledge economy. And for that, you should be very, very proud. I'm not an Argentinian. You can hear that by my accent and the fact that I'm not speaking your beautiful and poetic language. But if I were an Argentinian, I would be a very proud man. It should not take for granted. This is a huge achievement. If this is the end of the road, the end of the journey, it's just a beginning. But this is an amazing, amazing way to start a journey. Mm -hmm. Try to summarize this, this, this whole discussion about uh, going back and forth between uh, Argentina and Israel. Um, we should know <coughs> that public-private partnership is the fastest economical growth engine that exists today. There is, no other, there is no other practices or no other policies that enable an economy to grow fast. Those cars can be uh, accelerated, accelerate from zero to 200 in a second or two. It's amazing, only if you know how to drive it. So if you don't, then you will crash very fast. And, and, and the idea of knowing how to drive it is to identify the risk factor within those uh, policies which are highly sophisticated and complicated and build them right to the uh, uh, culture, to the regulations, and, uh, uh, and, and to the nation. And it's, and it's not about the driver. And it's not about the cars. And it's not about the team that will support and fix those cars. It's the collaboration between public and private that enable those uh, uh, drivers to uh, to reach uh, the first uh, the first uh, uh, first place in, in those uh, uh, in those races. Um, there is no evidence, no whatsoever, in any place in the world that an ecosystem is just, an agri ecosystem is just grow spontaneously. <coughs> there is no. The creation of an ecosystem is not a spontaneous process. This is government responsibility. It did not happen, it could not happen, and it will not happen if government will not be committed for that. The continuity of the ecosystem is not an automatic process. This is government responsibility. Remind the two case studies of the two worldwide, the, the two world crises, as September 2000 and August 2008. And the state of Israel continued to invest like nothing has happened. Last but not least, I, I think you should, you should, you should know and, and bear that in mind that developing a knowledge economy capability within the nation, it's not a privilege. It's not nice to have. A nation that will not develop knowledge economy capabilities in the future will either stay behind with a gap that it is not clear that money will be able to solve it. 
because this gap of other economy that will be developed will be very, very hard to close. Because the factors that created this gap of nations that develop knowledge economy is not always related to the land that you can grow soya or related to the people that will be considered to be a cheap working force. They are going to be something else. And this something else is the something that will create us gap. Argentina cannot allow herself to be left behind. <clears throat> and actually, you don't have any reason. <clears throat> you have everything. You have highly educated uh, uh, society. Uh, you have a very uh, entrepreneurial people ranked by the Inter-Latin American Developing, uh, the Inter-Latin uh, Inter Venture Capital Association, after. Uh, Argentina is the largest manufacturer of entrepreneurs. Where are they? All over. Colombia, Chile, Uruguay, the state, not that one. You've got everything which takes. The only thing that you need to have is an understanding that you can do it, that you have succeeded to achieve a significant achievement in the last two years, show you that there is a case study that knowledge can be created. Like CITES, and I wish in Argentina that there would be another 20 CITES. And it doesn't make any sense because I'm I'm a partner and I'm creating myself a, 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 a competition. But I'm guaranteed to you <coughs> that without another 20 cities or another several policies that will support the utilization of knowledge economy, Argentina will not be able to create a critical mass and Argentina will not succeed. You have done great, but this is not a time to maintain, this is a time to accelerate. <coughs>